Okay, good afternoon everybody and welcome to one of the final sessions in the battle for our brain strand here at the Battle of Ideas. The session's called Smart Drugs, Magic Bullets or Cheating Ourselves. My name is Helen Bertelsall and I'm the chair and producer for this session as well as the resources and communications manager for the Institute of Ideas Debating Matters competition. We're really delighted that the partners for this session and indeed for the entire Battle for Our Brain strand are the Wellcome Trust, um, who have been something of an inspiration actually for this particular session. So on to um, the smart drugs debate then. There's no doubt um, that something's going on in universities and conference rooms on both sides of the Atlantic. Here in the UK, it's been estimated by one of our speakers that around 16% of university students are using what are being called smart drugs, medication that's available on prescription um, and is also being sold on the internet for conditions such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's that are now being used by healthy people to enhance memory, concentration and other cognitive abilities. In the United States, recent research has suggested that as many as 25% of students in some universities are doing the same and surveys outside of the university sector reflect a similar trend. At the same time um, as some appear to be taking pills that cram more memories in, others are looking forward to a time when they can wipe memories out. So investigations, particularly into the nature of post-traumatic stress disorder, have discovered certain amnesia drugs that can block, dilute and even delete unwanted and unhappy memories. Once again, um, drugs originally used to treat disease might now be used to dull the pain um, of traumatic events. So the turn towards um, what has been called cosmetic neurology marks an important shift in medicine and raises interesting um, and important questions about their use. Does a move towards enhancement mark a new <coughs> ethical terrain in the project of human improvement? How do memories or their lack shape who and what we are? Can and should we distinguish between enhancement and therapeutic forgetting? And what does the bid to remember and forget say about us as a society? So here today we have four tremendous speakers to discuss some of these issues. So let me introduce them in the order in which they're going to speak. Kicking us off um, at the end there is Professor Andy Meir, um, who's the director of the Creative Futures Research Centre and the Chair of Ethics and Emerging Technologies at the University of the West of Scotland. Um, Andy's research discusses the intersections of art, ethics, technology and culture, and he's published broadly in areas of emerging technologies, particularly related to human enhancement. Now, if there's a feature that you've heard on, on the radio um, or on television around enhancement, whether it be on Radio 4 or Newsnight, then Andy will almost certainly um, have been on that programme, so it's really great... Um, to have you with us and welcome, Andy. Our second speaker is Barbara Sahakian, who's the Professor of Clinical Neuropsychology at the MRC Wellcome Trust Behavioural and Clinical Neurosciences Institute at the University of Cambridge. Barbara is an internationally renowned scientist um, in the fields of cognitive psychopharmacology, neuroethics, neuropsychology, neuropsychiatry and neuroimaging. Her research in cognition and depression, neuroethics and the early detection of Alzheimer's disease is particularly well known. And importantly for this session, Barbara's work has recently led her to the study of cognitive enhancement using pharmacological treatments. Once again, um, if you've come across um, a recent discussion um, around research in this area, then Barbara's almost certainly your woman. So again, I'm really delighted that you can join us. Speaking third is a long-time friend of the Battle of Ideas, Professor Simon Wesley. Simon's the Vice Dean for Academic Psychiatry and Chair and Head of Department of Psychological Medicine at the Institute of Psychiatry, <coughs> King's College London. He's also Honorary Consultant Advisor in Psychiatry to the British Army um, and one of the new Foundation um, Senior Investigators of the National Institute of Health Research. Simon's interests are within the grey areas between medicine, psychiatry, clinical epidemiology, psychiatric injury and military health 
and he's published on a huge range of subjects from post-traumatic stress to shell shock to chronic pain. But most importantly, he's always um, fascinating to listen to, which is why he's invited back again and again and again to speak at the Battle of Ideas. So it really is great to have you with us. Last but by no means least, let me introduce our final speaker, Dr Stuart Derbyshire, who is also another great friend of the Battle of Ideas. Stuart um, is a reader in psychology at the University of Birmingham and his main research interest is neuroimaging and pain and he's written extensively on these topics. He's also an associate editor um, of the journal Pain and the journal Psychosomatic Medicine. But Stuart's work really does extend um, beyond imaging though to deeper questions of what it actually means to be human and how experience develops. So his work is regularly quoted in international media, and he can often be seen and heard on TV and radio. In fact, many of you might have seen him the other week um, on the Darren Brown show, which is, I've heard it mentioned about 15 times in the past five years, but um, Stuart was on that the other week. Sorry. Um, but again, we won't hold it against him, but we're delighted to have him with us. Okay, welcome all of our speakers then. I'm going to ask Andy to kick us off. Well, it seems to me that there's a significant aspect of this question that is, for pardon the pun, a no-brainer. No -brainer. It seems to me that people would quite happily enhance themselves if they could. The question is more about whether, we're, whether it's safe, whether it's likely to yield the kind of results we expect. So if you're wondering what sorts of enhancements would arise from smart drugs, then if, there's no clarity on that. If you could improve your memory, perhaps. You can improve your ability to remember where you put your keys. You can remember where... I think, I think one of the major possibilities is to increase cognitive functioning, for example, in a conference, being able to understand what people are saying. Now, they're no guarantee they're going to help, of course. And in fact, what you might be able to conclude more effectively is that, in fact, what's being spoken is quite a lot of nonsense. But nevertheless, that could be quite a helpful thing. But the point, I think, is, is most crucial is that there's no single way in which people would want to enhance their cognitive functions. So the idea that having smart drugs would give rise to a world where we'd happily enhance ourselves in exactly the same way, I think is misleading. It seems to me that we all employ a very different definition of what it would mean to be smarter, depending on the kind of things that you value. So you might wish to improve your analytical capabilities if you're a philosopher, a scientist, or a chess player, for, for example. You might wish to improve your capacity to empathise with other people. This might be a, a form of emotional intelligence that could be improved by some kind of technological intervention. Of course, the rub here is that, in fact, you probably would want to improve each of those depending on the circumstances. And so then the question becomes whether, in fact, using a smart drug to improve one aspect of your identity would give rise to a trade-off on another aspect of your identity. Not a, not a proposition that I think is borne out in literature. But nevertheless, one of the challenges with smart drugs might be the trade-offs that you have to make, as is the case for any kind of interventions. And this is where it gets tricky, because I think the, the crucial problem is whether we allow people to make those decisions for themselves. Now, there's a big kind of um, shadowy ghost in the background that, that will say that these drugs are unsafe. So if we have examples today that are showing examples like, like was mentioned at the beginning, where students are using drugs to help them pass exams, well, the response to that might be that's a bad thing because, of course, these drugs could have all sorts of long-term or medium-term consequences that could be to the detriment of those individuals. So then it becomes a, a trade-off again. Do you decide to sacrifice some kind of long-term health for some immediate benefit, like passing your exams if you think you're not likely to? And I think, for me, it comes down to you having to make that judgment call. From a state perspective, the obligation is to make these drugs as safe as possible. So yes, nobody would want to take a drug that's going to kill them instantly. Then you'd probably you know, not be that smart at all. But the idea that you could make these decisions about what matters to you in life and if that implies a sacrifice of some kind, I think that's perfectly fine. So the idea that smart drugs are perhaps, and I'm responding a little bit to an essay I wrote for The Independent earlier in the week, where people argue things like, well, one thing is to be smarter, but what is it to be wiser? You know, of course, you can have these drugs that can make you superhuman, but are you actually any wiser in life? And it seems to me that, again, it sort of mis it, it, it disrupts the argument. I think it, it mislocates the, the concern. Of course, um, having drugs isn't going to make you wiser necessarily, but I think having the cognitive, cognitive capacity to, for example, understand a range of perspectives more effectively can sensitize you to the interests that other people might have, and that perhaps will lead to greater wisdom in being able to respect those interests. So it seems to me there's no trade-off between smartness and wisdom, that in fact, if you want to be wiser, then this is a more effective route to do it. Importantly, 
I don't think they are magic bullets. Um, I don't think they're cheating ourselves either. So the idea that, in fact, a smart drug would lead to you being of, of superior status, I think, is misleading. Let's take, for example, language. You remember from The Matrix being able to download another skill, whether it's a kung fu, I think it was in the film, or language. Language is a great example because learning another language, people tend to go, a very, go through a very long journey to do that. And that journey doesn't just involve learning the words, learning the grammar. It involves immersing yourself in the culture, having an understanding of the values of a community. So again, here, the idea that the smart drugs, which may improve your ability to understand um, new words more efficiently, doesn't lead to you having a greater understanding of that culture necessarily. It has to be complemented with other techniques. But I think, crucially, they could play a very important part and a very valuable role. We are a society that doesn't speak very well other languages. And so why not try to improve our capacities to do so? It's argued that as you get beyond a certain age, you lose the ability to learn languages as effectively as a, as a child might. So if there are biological limitations there, the argument to use the, uh, another form of technology to improve those capacities seems to me very strong, especially if you want to live in a world where we understand each other. So certainly it's not the case that smart drugs would lead to some kind of magic bullet to improve ourselves, but they're one tool through which you can do so. They're not the only tool, they're one that I think you can choose, and I think I'll leave it there. Okay, well, we all want to enhance our mental capital and well-being over the life course, and that's a goal that we often have, and it's a very important one. There's lots of things that can help us improve our mental capital so that we won't have stresses or disorders, um, especially in old age, we're functioning quite well. And there's a number of different ways we could boost our brain power, and two of my favorite ones are education, because obviously I'm a university professor, but also physical exercise. Physical exercise has been, it's good for your mood, it's good for your mind, and of course it's good for your physique. And it's been shown to uh, increase neurogenesis in different areas of the brain, including the hippocampus. But today we're going to talk about smart drugs. Well, why do we use, why do we need them? Why, why do I study them in my laboratory? Well, the reason I study them is that uh, most neuropsychiatric disorders have a component, which is uh, a cognitive problems that these people have. So obviously for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, people have problems with impulse control, they have problems with um, sustaining attention and so forth. And in schizophrenia, there's also cognitive problems. And of course, cognitive problems in terms of memory and Alzheimer's disease are well known. And I've worked on some of the treatments. The, I did some proof of concept studies for the uh, cholinesterase inhibitors, which are the current uh, treatments for the cognitive symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, which improve attention and concentration in, in people with Alzheimer's disease. So it's very important that we continue to develop these drugs. And these are drugs that I work with in my laboratory. Uh, we commonly work with Ritalin or methylphenidate, <coughs> and I also work with atomoxetine and modafinil. And these are all, uh, you know, smart drugs. And Ritalin uh, acts by boosting dopamine and noradrenaline in the brain. So we understand the most probably about that drug because it's been around for a long time. Nobody really understands how modafinil works. And in my uh, laboratory, we have to invent tasks. And I've invented the Kentab tasks, <coughs> co-invented them. And they, that's so that we can actually measure cognition in the laboratory. So we actually can understand that certain functions, like what we call working memory, are improving after we give a drug, or that attention improves after we give a drug, or other forms of memory. So working memory is the kind of memory we use all the time when we're doing tasks. So you pull a lot of stuff together when you're, say, writing an essay, or you're trying to do some piece of work at, at work. And you pull this stuff together, and you use it for a little bit of time, and then you throw it out when you don't need it anymore. And it's a bit akin to looking up a telephone number in a phone book. Um, that's a sort of very simple form of working memory. Well, you might go 01223335568 or something like that. And, and you're repeating this over and over again. And then you close the book. And you're dialing as you're doing that. And suddenly you get through, and that's fine. But if you don't get through, you can't remember the number anymore because you chucked it out, because you don't want to remember all sorts of things, all, all the numbers that you've ever run across, because you'll never be able to keep anything important in your mind. 
And these now run on an iPad so we can test very easily <coughs> in the laboratory. And when we do test in the laboratory, we find, as might be expected, that on, in terms of working memory, um, children with the ADHD and adults with ADHD are both uh, have problems on working memory tasks. So they do not as well as uh, the uh, people without these disorders. And some of you may not realize, but about 50% of people who have ADHD as a child still have ADHD as an adult. And we run a clinic in Adbrooks Hospital for adult ADHD. Well, when we give Ritalin or methylphenidate, we actually get nice improvements in working memory, <coughs> both in adults with ADHD as, and well, as well as children with ADHD. But interestingly, when you give it to healthy volunteers, and these are Cambridge undergraduates, so they're functioning quite well, you still get improvements in working memories. And um, we can put people in the uh, scanner up at Anbrooks and uh, have them do the task while they're in the scanner, so we can look at the neural networks involved while they're doing the task. And what we find is not only do we get a better performance uh, from people taking Ritalin, but there's also an increased efficiency of the neural network that's involved while you're doing the task. And that Im involves a very important area of the brain called dors dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the front bit of the brain, which is very highly evolved in humans. Well, recently, some of you might have seen in the Sunday Times, which picked up the... Uh, study that we've done with modafinil uh, in sleep-deprived doctors, and this was done in collaboration with Imperial College. And what we found was that unfortunately sleep-deprived doctors aren't doing very well in their performance. They're showing impulsive behavior, and they're also not very cognitively flexible. So when they're problem-solving, they have some difficulties figuring out what the solution is if they don't land on the right solution in the first instance. But if they take modafinil, they're not impulsive, and they also show a great degree of uh, cognitive flexibility in problem solving. So if they don't get the first solution the first time, they're very good at switching to a new good solution to a problem. And of course, we know that uh, methylphenidate or Ritalin is on the increase for prescriptions, both in the USA, as shown here, but also in the UK. Um, stimulant uh, prescriptions have nearly doubled in the past 10 years. And as you heard, they're being used widely on college campuses. So about 16% of students on college campuses in the USA are using uh, these drugs, vitamin R or R-ball, as Ritalin's nicknamed. And it's perhaps not surprising, because the Academy of Medical Sciences has said that even a 10% improvement in a memory score might lead to a higher A-level grade or degree class. So you can understand that in competitive situations, uh, like your A-levels or your uh, taking your exams for a degree, that people might be tempted to take these drugs. And uh, the Varsity newspaper, which comes out of the University of Cambridge, it's a student newspaper, did their own survey, and they found one in ten students were using cognitive enhancing drugs. Mostly it was the philosophers and English people because they were writing long essays, and they took them there. And I actually found, as I was traveling and uh, speaking abroad, that... Uh, they, my academic colleagues were using them as well. They were using modafinil. So we have to think about the effects on the individual and on society of these drugs. And one of the biggest ones is the long-term side effects, especially in the developing brain. Because your, um, your brains are uh, in development since you're born all the way through to 21 years of age, and especially the frontal part of the brain. So we have to think about what the effects might be on a healthy person of using these drugs if they're a child or a, an adolescent. And then we have to think about coercion. We have to think about the dangers flying over the internet. We haven't looked at long-term safety of these drugs in healthy people yet, so that's a very big concern. And so you might be over-enhanced too. You might be plagued by unwanted memories, so we have to think about all of that. So we can um, enhance ourselves with smart drugs, but I wouldn't want to think that's the only way we could do it. We could do it through education, exercise, as I said. And we have to uh, be responsible in terms of what we want our society to be like in the future, and how do we see society evolving? Do we all want to be going into a 24-7 society taking smart drugs? But nonetheless, they may have a place for certain um, groups of people where we want to ensure safety for themselves or for other people, such as the military, and it might be that Simon Wesley picks up on that point. Thank you. I mean, what we're talking about here is not the use of, of enhancers in, in people with ADHD or Alzheimer's. Most of the debate 
is around use of it in healthy people. And I'm going to suggest that most of this, to be honest with you, is a bit of a storm in the teacup. Um, it's more about neurogossip rather than neuroscience, and we shouldn't really get too worried about much of what's happening. But I am going to conclude in general, still, despite that, we should be discouraging rather than encouraging these trends. So let's just start off with a bit of neurogossip then. The truth is, the effect of these cognitive enhancers is not exactly brilliant. Even in diseases like Alzheimer's, in which these are clearly a good thing, and people prescribe them in, in large amounts, or nice approved, etc., etc., the benefits are pretty modest. It's the equivalent of 12 weeks of deterioration of someone with Alzheimer's. So they get a kind of three months extra, as it were, but no more than that. And in the great scheme of things, these are not very uh, good uh, drugs at all. The future will lie in disease modifiers rather than cognitive enhancers. And if you haven't got Alzheimer's, the effect's not zero, as Barbara's shown, but it ain't great. Uh, and a better example would be the kind of vitamins and food additives and food supplements that you go if you go into any health food shop at the moment. You know, you've seen them all last year, they were all labelled on the shelves, things like boost your immune power. Now all they've done is simply change it and now they're exactly the same things. Now you're literally exactly the same compounds now say boost your brain power. Um, that was the immune system was so last year, this year it's all about brain power. And on the adage that a fool and his money is soon parted, well, if you take them, you will be parting with your money, and indeed you are unfortunately still, and perhaps even more than you were before, a bit of a fool. Now, they're also hyped. And in fact, Barbara's paper you just showed, your, your, your tired doctors, junior doctors, I don't know how the junior doctors get tired these days, they used to in my day, but oh, they work so little bloody hours at all, I don't know how they can possibly get tired. As soon as you meet them, they're going off on ships, and uh, it's terrible. But anyway, that, the, the, the headlines around that very nice paper, but if you looked at actually, Barbara showed you the headlines before, which was all about you know, doctors doing terrible things because they're tired, but the, the, what, what the, the media reports on that one, it actually said, doctors taking smart drugs perform better surgery. Now that sounds pretty good, but actually that's not what the paper said, it's not what Barbara said, it's not what the press release said. The results themselves, the authors themselves, specifically refuted that. Um, they said that it did, have to impair, it did improve some aspects of memory, but it classically and specifically did not lead to any benefit in performance, and yet it got hyped up. So the results were that, in theory, should surgeons be taking modafinil after a, a uh, night on call, they're more likely to remember which kidney to remove, good thing, of course, you might think that, but they're actually no better at all at removing it when they do so. So again, not much of a benefit. Now they are, of course, very popular, uh, as Barbara uh, has alluded to in a famous paper in Nature once showed, people take them for all sorts of reasons, improving concentration, improving focus, jet lag and so on. Um, but again, you also notice in the same study, fascinated to see, some people take them, and the reason given was partying, not quite sure how that helps, and another one was house cleaning. So not quite sure how that helps at all. Students. Uh, students, and now what certainly isn't bloody students. And that's not sure. I'm not judging by my son. Anyway, a lot of it is a placebo effect. I don't know if you read uh, Johan Harry's piece in, in the uh, Independent recently, who admitted to taking these drugs, and if that wasn't a perfect description of a placebo effect, I really don't know what was. So, we shouldn't get too excited, but there are reasons to worry. First of all, these are drugs, and at the risk of being extremely boring and very medical, but nevertheless, the drug that doesn't have side effects does not <coughs> exist. Actually, it does, they're homeopathic drugs, they don't have side effects. But <laughs> they, moving swiftly on, we've probably alienated half the audience, and the years have done before. Of course, yes, in general, the side effects that we know about are modest, but you have to remember, the way that these things work, the kind of randomized controlled trials that we use to determine side effects, first of all, are in general rather small, and they can only detect gross effects. It can sometimes take up to decays to detect either very mild effects, but still important, or extremely serious but rare effects. And in the life of these current compounds, we are at that early stage. And it may be decades before we will have a real understanding of the risk benefits. And there are risks, without a shadow of doubt, cardiac arrhythmias and so on. And, you know, you don't have to have very many people dying of a drug that they don't need for you to prove <coughs> that that may not be necessary. And they have unintended consequences. Now, as Helen said, I'm, I'm the psychiatrist of the army, and obviously we do think about these things, and the general doctrine in the UK, it's slightly different in the US, I'll admit, in the UK is these are not encouraged, they are not prescribed by military doctors, although some personnel do take them, they take them uh, under the counter. They're not part of policy in the RAF or in the, the army. 
And that's because the general view there is actually, overall, they probably are either neutral or actually harmful. That's what you gain on the swings of impaired uh, uh, attention, improvements of, you lose on the degradation of previously learned tasks. And for soldiers on long missions, pilots, etc., that latter thing is probably very important. Um, I'm slightly amused that the paper that I quoted when I had to write a position on this was the paper you just showed, Barbara, your Elliot et al. from 97. And, and that was your conclusion then. I mean, people are allowed to change their conclusions, but you did, you, that was actually what you said. We, we quote that to say there's no such thing as a free lunch, and what you gain on one, you lose on another. And I mean, I don't know if that's changed, but that certainly remains the position of the armed forces. And the more dramatic claims that are made for other drugs, you mentioned about suppressing traumatic memories, for example, again, um, we, we feel that this is a dangerous path to go down. Fortunately, they don't actually work. But if they did work, would we want to do that? Probably not. It, it's like, you know, I, I'm often approached by people who say, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could develop a drug that suppresses fear? I'm sure the army would be very interested in that. Can't think of anything worse, to be honest. It shows a complete misunderstanding of, of what we would want. That's exactly what we don't want. We want soldiers to show fear, um, um, because otherwise they're going to get themselves killed. So, again, we're also worried about some of the side effects. So there is, quite, there is a theoretical case to be made that monafinil, for example, could actually increase dramatic memories and could, um, and I think Barbara's alluded to that, and uh, continue, funny enough, thinking about poor old Johan Harry again, perhaps another side effect of it is that it, it uh, leads you to increase the number of quotes that you make up in your newspaper articles, but who can say whether or not that's true. Overall, then, we're, I, I'm inclined to be cautious on this. We have no idea, really, the long-term social, uh, psychological, or indeed medical effects of children on long-term medications, how they will grow up, and how they will think of themselves, what kind of a person they think they are, um, because they've had to take drugs uh, for their kind of brain, as it were, since they were a child. And one should also be cautious about the fairness of all this all. Let's just say, for the sake of argument, that this is useful for kids doing exams, and let's just say it has the same effect as getting your little kid extra French lessons or mass tuition, and who could possibly argue with that? But nevertheless, if that is the case, then you can be damn sure that the folks who are taking this, the parents who are giving their drug, uh, these kind of drugs to their children, will be the same as those who are also arranging extra mass tuition and extra French tuition. In other words, it will forever and always be the information-rich middle classes who care, and those who might possibly need it, for sure won't get it. So overall, then, we should be cautiously against these things as opposed to cautiously encouraged. I'm going to agree with um, quite a lot of what Simon just said with regards to um, the usefulness of um, smart drugs. So I don't, I think smart drugs are not as useful as is often being made out to be. And I think the reason for that is, is manifold, you know, lack of development and what have you. But also I think there's a reason associated with the way in which neuroscientists look at human beings. So we do have a tendency to be a little bit too mechanical in their view of human beings. Barbara mentioned that an important part of memory is forgetting. Uh, but we tend to forget that, haha, <laughs> when we are doing our neuroscience. <laughs> and it, um, it's not really just about enhancing an ability to associate two things that will not necessarily help you to learn. Um, most of the time when you're learning, you're having to pick out the things that are important and drop the things that are not important. If you can't do that, you're not going to learn very well. So just remembering more stuff um, is not very good. Also, neuroscientists have a horrible tendency to exaggerate um, the degree to which they're able to manipulate um, what we are and able to um, specifically attack um, certain parts of our cognition. So, again, Barbara mentioned the dopamine system. Um, serotonin has also been attacked um, for a variety of different um, reasons. And we have this class of drugs called the serotonin-specific reuptake inhibitors, which sounds very fancy and very precise, specific reuptake inhibitors. I just want to read off a list of the things that serotonin has been claimed um, to be responsible for. So, serotonin has been claimed to be responsible for depression, aggressiveness, suicide, stress, lack of self-confidence, failure, low impulse control, binge eating, substance abuse, chronic fatigue, obsessive behaviour, panic, attention deficit disorder, personality disorders, migraine, autism. And that list is not exhaustive, and I can come up with a similar list um, for dopamine as well. So I don't think our neuroscience is as precise and as good as we make it out to be, and that's part of the reason why our enhancing drugs are not as good um, as they might um, be sound like they are. Having said that, I also agree with Andy's point that um, where we can use these things as an enhancement, where they can be useful, then we should use them. 
And I don't like um, spurious arguments put in the way of us using stuff um, that might be <coughs> useful. And there's a lot of spurious arguments, I think, put in the way um, of using um, cognitive enhancers, um, despite the fact that they don't actually work that well. And I'm going to do is just go through those reasons and, and knock them down. So the first reason why um, people say we shouldn't use <coughs> enhancers is because um, human enhancement is going to alter human nature in negative ways. So Francis Fukuyama has argued that the most significant threat from biotechnology is the possibility it will alter human nature and thereby move us into a post-human stage of history. Fukuyama worries that engineering human beings to be smarter, stronger, faster, and so on will undermine the human essence, which he describes as the divine gift or spark that all human beings are born with and the species-typical characteristics shared by all human beings qua human beings. I think this argument lacks force because the use of technology um, to improve our own state of being is the most human thing that human beings have do. So the development of medicine, industry, transportation, communication, clean water, stable food supply, warm habitats, and so on, somewhat um, sells the point. These are entirely human affairs, things that we've done to improve the human condition. There's nothing post-human about extending the manipulation of nature to our own bodily processes. We've already altered human nature and that we now live longer and healthier lives than at any previous time in history. And most of us think this development is positive. Another objection is that attempts at human enhancement will exacerbate inequity between people. So it's a routine objection um, that these efforts will favour the rich. If there's a pill to make a person smarter, the rich will buy it to become smarter and more able to lord it over the poor people. Now, it's certainly the case that um, time-saving and life-enhancing technologies do tend to be adopted first by those who have the greatest wealth, and, as it happens, therefore, the least need for the technology. That, however, is just the way the world is, and the way to resolve that is to alter the social structure so that wealth and power are distributed in a more equitable fashion. To suggest that human enhancement should halt so as to not make the inequity any worse is a rather grotesque and negative solution. It's an argument for innovation to stop, which would be bad for everybody, rich and poor. It is quite likely that the pill to make you smarter and healthier would first be taken by the rich, but a pill could eventually be much more accessible to the less well-off than, say, exclusive schools or private health care. We may object to the rich having preferential access to better education and health care, but we don't advocate abolishing education and health care in order to close that gap. Another argument is that attempts at human enhancement will <coughs> always be all the same. So if human enhancement will not exacerbate differences, then perhaps it will smooth them all away until we're just one bland ocean of sameness. It's desperately unlikely that any intervention <coughs> can iron away all the variations in biology, environment, and personhood. But regardless, if everybody becomes equally much smarter and equally much healthier, I don't see the problem. Another argument is that attempts at human enhancement will be coercive. If there is a pill to make us smarter, we may eventually be forced to take it, lest we fall behind everybody else. It's going to be increasingly difficult, it's argued, to get into university, get a job, or maybe get life and health insurance if we don't consume the human enhancement products. There is probably some truth to this idea as well. If there's a drug that's available, that's cheap, highly efficacious, easily available, safe, and could readily enhance performance, then there would be pressure to take that drug. Again, this is desperately unlikely. But even if such a wonder drug was to become available, the pressure to consume would not be any different or greater than the pressure to adopt other seemingly more mundane practices. Families, for example, face pressure to buy computers and provide internet access for their school children. Young adults face pressure to go to university, obtain a degree. Clearly, we're able to manage these pressures and live with the decisions we make. There's no reason to believe that pressure towards pharmacological enhancement would be any more or less difficult um, to manage. Another argument is that attempts at human enhancement will undermine real achievement. Um, so going to university um, involves effort and dedication. Taking a pill to modify DNA or your brain or whatever involves neither. Certainly it is true um, that taking a pill is easier than studying. But it is impossible, I would argue, despite the diminished standards of current university education, to put a degree inside a pill. If you wish to understand War and Peace or anything else, you've still got to read the book. Um, the best that can be hoped for is that the pill will make studying less of an effort. I do have some sympathy with the idea that the challenges of life are necessary for a sense of achievement um, and good character and all that stuff. But that doesn't mean that we need to force challenges onto people by making them walk to work or grow their own food or build their own shelter or whatever it is you think will make people grow. We tend to allow people to seek out their own challenges. If a pill makes studying easier, 
that might make education less of a challenge. But it could equally make it more of a challenge because the student is able to go deeper <coughs> into their subject area. That choice um, would still remain. So my bottom line is this. If a drug is not safe, then you shouldn't take it. If a drug is not affordable, then you can't take it. And if a drug is not effective, then there's no need for you to take it. But if there existed a pill that was safe, affordable and effective, why would you not want to take it? And why would anyone get upset about your decision to do so? It's something, um, Andy, that, that Simon alluded to, and it was something actually that I noted in one of the responses to your article in, in The Independent. Aren't smart drugs in some way symptomatic of a wider get-something-for-nothing um, kind of a society? And Is that in any way something to, to be concerned about? No, I don't think it is. I mean, again, this sort of question came up in the session I talked in earlier, and it's everyone but us. I mean, I'm not sure how many people feel that they're, in that, they're part of that society where they want to get something for nothing. It's a very, you know, maybe helpful political rhetoric to try to encourage people to do more, but I think that it's, it's, a, it's a red herring as far as to understand <coughs> how people live their lives. Now, of course, people will try to seek out efficiencies to help them live a more fruitful life, perhaps. So... Um, anything we can do to achieve that, I think, is, is something that people will entertain the idea of. A smart drug that could help you study for an exam or win a chess. Now, whether it's tweet cheating ourselves, I think, is, is, is a, it depends very much on the context. Um, cheating tends to imply uh, the breaking of some previously agreed upon rules. Now, that may work in the context of a, of a sport or a game where you play it with someone and you agree the rules beforehand, and if you break those rules, then th there's a problem. But it seems to me, the, taking a broader societal perspective, we don't agree those rules at the start. We try to find whatever means are available to us to help us flourish. Now, it's clear that this might not lead to our flourishing if, it, if we end up you know, shortening our lives or having all kinds of health problems later on, and uh, people can decide whether they think that's a way of improving themselves or not. But there's no sense in which we're, we're cheating ourselves. I think that the idea that this is uh, betraying some kind of social contract that we've, we've entered into by virtue of being part of a society is misleading. I think that um, certainly we don't, have, we don't all have equal access to the range of ways in which we could enhance ourselves and to that extent it's, it's in fact more likely that something like smart drugs could equalise the playing field. It'll certainly disrupt it. So I don't think that, uh, and again one, one should take the perspective that yes if a technology is available initially uh, it might be affordable to others but as you said Stuart that if it progresses, then it'll become more affordable. So I'm, I'm quite convinced of the trickle-down effect that the idea that something like drugs in particular can be more affordable given the right social system. Now we know on a global level that doesn't work very well. We know that parts of the world can't even get drugs to help themselves become well. But that's a, that's a social failure. It's not something that I think it, that needs to concern us on a personal moral level. It's a social moral problem. The risks that are associated with manipulating our brains isn't that qualitatively different to other forms of enhancement? So I'm thinking particularly here about drugs in sport, actually. Mm. Aren't smart drugs qualitatively different in the impacts that they have? Yes, I mean, I, I tend to agree with you. I mean, obviously, once you ingest something, you know, it's quite invasive because there's no way to sort of stop that happening. And at the moment, with people buying drugs over the internet, I mean, you have no way of knowing whether you know, they're counterindicated for you or whether you're taking another medication that they might interact with. So um, I think one has to be concerned about that. On the other side, one of the reasons we were looking at modafinil for sleep-deprived doctors is because the current mode of uh, keeping awake and alert was coffee. And by the time they drank a lot, a lot of coffee, of course the caffeine was giving them side effects like tremor and palpitations and things like that. So there may be um, you know, good cognitive enhancing drugs which have a safer uh, side effect profile and as you heard from Simon, all these drugs have some side effect profile but we might be able to find a better one. But yes, I'm, I'm extremely concerned about people buying these drugs over the internet because first of all they don't know what they're <coughs> buying and second of all they, they're not actually consulting their doctor to see if it's safe for them. So thinking in particular about higher education, aren't you in any way worried that the use of smart drugs um, f amongst students or even um, academics actually has an effect where it actually degrades education it itself in a way? No, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, 
I think I think that's to misunderstand what education is. I think actually the idea that you could somehow degrade education by taking a pill probably reflects how far we've degraded education uh, rather than the pill itself being the problem. So we think education is just about making simple associations between stuff, and it's not. It's about thinking as deeply as you possibly can and being creative. Um, it's about reading an awful lot. And no amount of pill taking can ever replace that. You know, that, that process is utterly independent of what it is you might stuff into your body, whether you drink 20 cups of coffee or two, um, it's not going to make a difference between um, whether or not you're a good or a bad student. Simon, thinking particularly about the memory blockers, which I know you said don't work, but let's imagine that they, they do. What do you think about the idea of people actually trying to suppress memories that are um, traumatic and troubling? The idea is that they don't develop, that the link between the memory and, and yeah. the, the emotional content that it has will not develop. As I say, you know, most of us think that actually when, when something horrible happens to you, you're supposed to feel bad about it and you're supposed to feel scared. And uh, obviously it becomes a problem later on if you keep feeling scared for years and years. And by the way, there are very good treatments for that. Um, but to stop the initial emotion, which is the idea, I'm putting it rather crudely, but that is the idea. As I say, even if it could be done, and unfortunately at the moment we don't think it could, could be done, even if it could be, it wouldn't be a good thing. But actually, I don't want to ask, I want to, I want to kick Stuart, because it's, no, it's good, cause <laughs> very rare that I'm in opposition to Stuart. It's rather nice, <laughs> but... And I, that's why you said that it was desperately unlikely that those kind of coercion scenarios that you mentioned would happen. <coughs> I suggest it was actually desperately likely that they would happen. The study that Barbara mentioned, um, okay, that this is the huge nature study of uh, what um, academics think it was and others would do. And fair enough, most parents said, no, no, they wouldn't give their children stimulants. And that was a horrible idea. 86% said they wouldn't. So that sounds fine, doesn't it? Except this thing the tail. A third of them said, however, if other children in the class were getting them, they most assuredly would. And that's clearly coercion because we're talking about children. So they'd be giving it along with cod liver oil or whatever. So again, so that's the third of the parents said they would coerce their kids if someone else in the class was you know, getting into university or getting that Cambridge place because they were being given cognitive enhancers. But that's not so good. And that's what would happen if you went to that Tiger Mother session that was on. Uh, an hour just before, you wouldn't be in any doubt whatsoever. That is what a third of parents would do. What I was actually pointing out was that it's desperately unlikely is that we would have a drug that was cheap, highly efficacious, easily available, safe, and could readily enhance performance. So that's, that's what I was getting at, that's un unlikely. Okay, I was yeah, so there you go. So. But, <laughs> but to, in the spirit of your question, you well. uh, yes, no, I, I also said that you know, there's probably some truth to the idea that it would be um, a certain amount of pressure um, to take that drug, just as there's a certain amount of pressure to go to after school care and take part in archery and go and do polo and swimming and God knows what else it is that middle yeah. class, upper class parents force their poor children yeah. um, to do in preparation for university. It's not that children are giving informed consent. You know, if they were 18, that's fine, but they're not. And yeah. a certain amount of pressure is a euphemism, but they would be told to do it. It sounds a little bit like an ethical debate. Um, no one's used the ethical word yet. If everybody was able to get a safe, um, drug that was able to enhance them, the playing field would stay the same, wouldn't it? If its effect was minimal and didn't last, then if you got through university, I'm talking about kids at university, if you got through university and you did well, to maintain that, you would then need to continue to take the drug. And then we'd have another insulin, wouldn't we? I, 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 I think that um, if it's good, and everybody gets it, then there's no, no great improvement at all. Historically, I've used caffeine to pass my exams. I, I think it's really good and improves my recall <laughs> uh, quite dramatically. So, and, and caffeine has been used for people who work, who are tired, to concentrate. Um, and in the right proportions, it can have good effects. Uh, so in a way, do we already have uh, a mind drug, a smart drug, that's uh, widely available and very cheap? Uh, why, if that's so, then why aren't parents giving this to their children? Does this show that if we did have a smart drug, then it wouldn't be widely distributed? I think this whole discussion kind of really underestimates people a bit. I mean, students take loads of drugs. They experiment with all sorts of things, from recreational, you know, to... to I mean, I, I'm not a, a, a sort of caffeine experimenter. I mean, I used to cram for exams, and I tried the caffeine one year, and... My mother came in. She said all she could see was this huge pile of blankets shaking uncontrollably. But the problem, of course, was I didn't stop shaking. And the whole exam, I, I 
couldn't, I could hardly write. So it didn't really help me very much. I knew the amphetamine takers, right, in the days when I studied. You could still get hold of them legally. Um, you know, stopped using them, right? Because they go halfway through the exam and then they get the downer. The effects wore off and they couldn't do a damn thing for the rest of the exam, right? But we all learned from those experiences, right? But seriously, a lot of parents will, will go into using drugs for their children, whether they've got ADHD or perhaps less serious um, problems. But parents aren't fools, you know. They can make a judgment along with their GPs and so forth, whether these things are having side effects, whether they're being effective or not. And a lot of parents who start Ritalin will stop it because the child will have some side effects or it will aggravate um, you know, aspects of their behavior or else it will make them into zombies. And parents say, I'd rather live with a hyperactive child than the child who's almost zombie-like. Are we seeing it um, as cognitive enhancement a bit too quickly? The fact that um, taking these smart drugs can improve certain aspects of, of our cognitive ability, some of the failures that we experience, and those struggles and failures, and you know, a lot of effort that we need to put into uh, learning um, and educating ourselves are sometimes as important in enhancing our cognitive ability. If it turns out that um, we don't actually get any good cognitive enhancing drugs, and it's all, I almost think, kind of, what are the neuroscientists all doing? You know, surely, surely they must be, surely, surely we must be finding something out about the brain that we can enhance it in some way, that it can do some of the things that we'd prefer to do. And so I find it a bit difficult to think it's all a kind of zero sum game where just, um, you know, one capacity will be slightly enhanced, another one will be. It just it seems, it seems unlikely that's going to be the case. In, in the long term, and if that's the case, it really, are, I mean, is it really that worrying that you know, as we come to learn more about the way that our brains work, and uh, you know, think, I'm, you know, that we we don't want to stop doing. Think about it, uh, somebody who is learning to play the violin or something like that, and might just you know enhance their ability to concentrate. Um, you know, would that really be such a would that be such a terrible thing? I mean, it doesn't. I mean, it's been cast in terms of exams. I mean, I can think of lots of examples where it didn't. Uh, but I, but I think it's a bit of a myth, though, the idea that parents, like anyone else, instinctively knows whether drugs will work or not or what side effects are. If that was the case, we wouldn't ever need to do such things as RCTs, <coughs> randomised controlled trials. We wouldn't need to do post-marketing surveillance. Unfortunately, the very reason that we have to do those things is that we don't know side effects. We also know that people, when they're self-medicating or buying over-the-counter medication, consistently underestimate the known side effects and they can't estimate the unknown side effects because they simply don't know. So I'm afraid, you know, it's nothing, it's nothing about being for or anti-parents, it's just saying that actually learning the true cost-benefits of a drug is a bloody difficult thing and can take many, many years before you finally understand its full workings on a large-scale population intervention. So I'm afraid if you, giving, if you are going to give your kids these drugs, you are accepting a certain unknown risk that's what's happening now. You may think it's worth it or not, but the fact is, it is unknown. I have to also say that we don't know the long-term risks of these drugs. You may think you do, and you may think you'll be able to spot it in your kid. The truth is, you're deluding yourself. A reflection on that uh, discussion, which is that I have had anecdotal comments made to me by um, psychiatrists in America that they have a lot of pressure put on them from the parents. Um, the, other, the other thing I would like to say, I disagree with Simon. I think that the cholinesterase drugs are very important. They're very good treatment for people with Alzheimer's disease. NICE doesn't approve things uh, very wildly because they don't like to pay for things. But they have had to be forced into approving them even for the mild stages of Alzheimer's disease. So they are approved for the mild and moderate stages. But also I'd like to say about modafinil, the interesting thing there is, as Simon pointed out, with methylphenidate or Ritalin, it's been shown that if you're a, a poor performer, you probably will improve uh, after Ritalin. If you're already performing very high, you may not have beneficial effects. But even on some tests, as I've shown you, you can get benefits in, say, Cambridge undergraduates, who I assume are performing quite well, although, you know, lack of sleep and so forth. Most of us don't always perform at our optimal level because we're frequently jet-lagged or <coughs> exhausted or stressed or whatever. 
So um, I would say with modafinil, we haven't as yet seen any impairments in performance, even in high performers. You either get better or you don't change at all. So some of these things could be beneficial. And people have pointed out that a lot of musicians use these drugs in order to be able to play a piece really well all the way through and to keep the concentration and gives them great pleasure. And they feel that they enhance the audience's experience by <coughs> being able to do that. So there may be, um, besides the things that we've been talking about, drug <coughs> doctors and so forth, there may be other cases where people just want to have the benefits of uh, improving themselves. Um, whether this is the right way or not um, remains to be seen. Thank you. Stuart. Yeah, if Simon's only going to prescribe drugs when he knows the unknown side effects, I would imagine that means he's never going to prescribe any drugs. Um, it, it's, I think there's a certain exaggeration of the... Uh, um, just the, the, what we don't know, and also an exaggeration of how um, just um, weak and fragile people are. You know, I mean, people do all kinds of things all the time to try and enhance themselves. You know, I once went on a tryptophan rich diet, and the crazy idea that this was going to somehow make me smarter, um, all it did is make me eat a lot of walnuts and bananas and turkey. But, uh, you know, I didn't think that I needed to seek medical advice for that change in diet. You know, we do lots and lots of things all the time to um, try and um, change the way we think, feel, and what have you. Um, most of the audience seem to agree with me, so I'll just pick up on the two people that didn't. So there was an <laughs> argument at the front about um, the pointlessness. I think, I, maybe I'm not understanding what you're saying, but um, I think it'd be great to make everybody smarter. I mean, that, well, how could that be a, a bad thing? So if there was a drug that worked that made people smarter and everybody could take it, I, I guess that would be good. We should put it in the water, why not? Or on the other hand, we could have just a better education system, and I'd probably um, go with that first. And then I liked Rob's question about what the hell are the neuroscientists doing. Um, at the risk of um, sounding like Martha, you know, it's complicated, Rob. There's three billion neurons up there. They make 10,000 connections each, and it's not straightforward. You know, there isn't something we can just stuff in the system um, that makes everything work in a well-oiled fashion. Give us a bit more time, a lot more money, um, at least another 25 years until I retire, and, and then I'm going to not mind so much. As <laughs> needed. I'd like to pick up on that first question as well about ethics because we didn't talk about ethics and of course one of the challenges with this debate is it has moral implications for a range of aspects of our society so it has implications for how doctors practice medicine, it has implications for how we think about our own sense of morality. I think Stuart's right, there, it, it is a zero-sum game so far as there's a competitive advantage arising from this, everyone has it. Uh, we might all be in the same position but of course not everyone adapts to drugs in quite the same way. So we'll see some differences there in terms of affecting that playing field. Uh, and maybe different qualities will become the more competitive, like being able to adapt more effectively becomes a prior value that you need to have. But um, yes, if everyone has smart drugs, if you think of a, a, a scientist in a laboratory trying to discover a cure for something, if they all had smart drugs, everyone in the lab, they might get to the conclusion quicker. Uh, that might make, put them in a competitive advantage against other people. But if everyone's got it, then we're all smart and all performing more effectively. So you have a, a raising of everybody's game, which I think is in the, in the benefit of humanity. Um, we're still competing against each other, so we have no relative advantage, but we're all performing at a higher level. And that, I think, is a good in itself. The question about the calculator, um, nobody cares about that because we believe, or we, we assume that the, the kinds of things that we are testing in those exams have gone beyond mere calculations. And I think that's another consequence of this kind of technology, that because of our ability to use it effectively, uh, we change what kinds of things matter about the test that we undertake. So we would see a change in the kinds of uh, skills we'd acquire, the, the way in which we'd go about acquiring them, and I think that would certainly give rise to a change in how society organises itself. It's interesting to hear about the, um, the musicians. In, in the athletic population as well, there's a higher proportion than in the general population that take modafinil. What I'm really curious about is if students take drugs and improve their performance, does that result in a lessening of the drugs that lecturers take when marking those essays? You know, that, that, that will be a great study to carry out, I think. <laughs> but we should be arguing against the exaggeration and oversimplification of all of this, because um, you're all talking about this perfect, simple, safe drug that would do it, but there isn't one. I don't see one coming. Um, and actually, if I'm honest, neuroscientists have a heck of a lot to do. There's little things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's that uh, have got no treatment and no cure and no anything. So I just think maybe we should be saying this is an interesting ethical debate, fascinating at conferences like this, but it's not likely to happen. It's already been mentioned that like context is everything, and I think there's like a couple of examples like to tease out on that basis. The first is that, well, they both revolve around like 
why are we feeling that we're taking these drugs? For example, in hospitals, like a doctors are really tired, so they're feeling they need to drink loads of coffee or take some smart drugs. Well, shouldn't we just have more doctors so they don't have to work stupid hours and so they can actually just perform the yeah. best of their ability? So it's like a bad context that's triggering this. And the same in education. Like, why do we have an exam system that just rewards like blurting out a load of content? It just rewards you cramming a load of like facts into your head. When in fact, like maybe we should be arguing for a better examination system that rewards something that's actually like a bit more productive than just putting a load of facts on a page. And the problem with junior doctors now is they work too few hours to, get to, to learn the skills that they need to learn. <laughs> okay. That, that's just that is what is happening. My question is on a similar sort of top, uh, uh, subject. And in terms of education, um, are we looking to create a generation who know lots more facts or are better at memorising facts? Are we when we're taking and giving people exams? Are we looking for kids who are better at, say, better at remembering the random facts or just the ability to learn facts? And do we really want to create a generation who reaches for a pill whenever they want to uh, learn? Is that, is that a particular issue? We've been speaking about students and junior doctors and, and medical kinds of things, but so many people in the world do these quite mechanical things. And from what I've heard, you're not talking about a drug that makes you magically smarter Smart's just a sort of media thing tacked on. You're talking about drugs that do specific things. For example, enhance concentration or, or, or um, enhance the ability to concentrate for a longer period of time or, or whatever it is. Those kinds of skills or, or enhancements would be actually be very, very much more useful to a lorry driver across Australia or something than they would to a student who's trying to, to, to read his Nietzsche. You, you know, so in terms of the uses to which these can be put, and already can be put, I, I would argue, once students start, take, start taking a drug, generally, within a few years, everybody else tries it too. And they don't necessarily use it for the same reason that students use it. So I'm, I'm really talking, trying to bring it back to sort of what can... You know, can you see the sorts of repetitive, mindless, boring sort of things that we all do do every day being enhanced? Or maybe we could just do them without knowing we're doing them, which would be even better. <laughs> I'm just worried, in general, about uh, cure and replacing care. And how we look to medicine and to drugs for quick fixes for our lack of care, proper care of ourselves and our children. I mean, it's quite clear today that the diseases that affect us are lifestyle diseases, stroke, heart disease, cancer, mental illness, obesity, and so on. And also, it's very clear that children and their performance is very much related to their, uh, the attention that they're given in their early years and uh, the attention that they're given in early years actually leads to programming for life in all their life view and potential. And I think that the more treatments and cures and quick fixes that we have, the more we'll get lazy about doing what we know we should do and paying attention to exercise and rest and uh, you know relaxation and correct diet and so on. I mean, just take a pill. Some philosophers at Oxford are taking these drugs, so I presume they're not lorry driving. Um, I, I assume what they say is they want to get in a good hard day's work of thinking. So obviously it isn't just for repetitive sorts of things that people take these drugs. And in fact, in my studies, one thing we looked at was cognitive flexibility in terms of problem solving. So as well as looking at sort of sustained attention and just raw memory power, we also look at, you know, is your behavior more impulsive or less impulsive, and are you uh, problem solving better? These drugs may have some effects on motivational uh, properties, which also have to do with, you know, both um, you know, your ability to get on with tasks that maybe are not so attractive to you. And we do know that they, um, like drugs like modafinil, will, um, in shift workers who have to work, say, out of hours, that it will inc increase their sustained attention and reduce accidents in the workplace. So I think, just to round it out, it isn't just on one area of cognition, there seems to be uh, improvements everywhere. And I would just remind the audience that most of us have strengths and weaknesses, so we don't all have good memories. We don't all have good problem-solving ability. And lots of people talk about wanting to boost things that they know they've been deficient in um, and has caused problems for them, maybe in not um, doing as well at, at school or university or perhaps in their job. I agree with their, all the comments, I think that, um, which isn't very good for a debate, but I think that the um, exaggeration, of course, there's a lot. I think that there's, um, 
There's a lot of uncertainty about what these drugs can do. It's great to have heard some more clarity on that. But I think a lot of people probably have never even heard of smart drugs and, and find it very difficult to know what kinds of effects they may have. Um, I think, however, there's still a role for speculative ethical debates like this. And I think that that's partly because the smart drugs debate is part of a broader enhancement debate that is cognitive but also physical. And so um, it, might, it might turn out that, that these drugs that, that Simon mentioned are never going to be safe enough for non-therapeutic uh, use, uh, are not the best route towards enhancing our cognition. Maybe it will be something like functional food, or maybe there's a way of trying to... And that, that might be a similarly quick fix, although you know, I don't know how many truckers eat very well on their journeys. I mean, no, I don't look into that. But the point is that there are ways in which, as your comment made earlier, we take things on the assumption that it, it might help our cognition, coffee to help be awake in the morning. Um, we don't know that for certain. On an individual level, you may be taking your coffee and believe strongly that it's helping you, um, but you can't verify it in a biochemical sense, and maybe you don't need to. But I think that the idea that we are convinced that some things do work for us has some value, even if they are placebos. So uh, it seems to me that the concern that these are red herrings or that they're somehow sm smoke and mirrors, that they aren't leading to enhancements in a, in a clinical sense, uh, isn't, isn't all there is to it. Well, first of all, just to reply to Barbara, I didn't say that uh, anticholinesterases, for example, don't work in Alzheimer's, and they are indeed uh, approved by NICE. I said they don't work very well, and that is true, and the only reason they were NICE approved was as a result of an enormously sustained campaign by the pharmaceutical industry. And I did say they give you about an extra, they're, they're the equivalent of preventing 12 weeks of deterioration, which in the life of someone with Alzheimer's is not very long. I mean, the, the example of musicians has been used. Musicians do use these drugs a lot, and often they do say it makes them play better. But when these trials are done in a double-blind fashion, so neither the musician and nor the audience know who took the drug and who didn't, at that point, you can't tell the difference between those who have the real drug and those who haven't. It's not a big issue. I mean, you know, this isn't something to get excited about because these effects are pretty mild. And as Andy said, it's a good thing to debate because it's interesting but and leads to all sorts of interesting issues. But this isn't the end of civilization as we know it. I, I don't believe that. It isn't going to change human nature. But I remain concerned, you know, in an in a, in a, in a equally modest way, that overall this is an area a bit like smoking, alcohol, etc. In the years to come, we may realize that we actually somewhat overestimated the benefits and dramatically underestimated the risks. That's what I suspect will happen in the decades to come. Stuart. And I've got a lot of sympathy what Fiona said about, you know, isn't the real target here the exaggeration? And I think you're, you're right. I would like um, the geneticists and the neuroscientists to calm down and be a bit more real about what it is they can and can't do. At the same time, I do think I wouldn't want to stop Barbara doing the things that she's doing. I think it's interesting work. I think we never know what's going to come out of it. Um, you know, we hope that useful things will come out of it. And that's the same for most science. You know, let the scientists do their thing. I don't think we can draw um, clear and easy distinctions between good and bad work. You know, I mean, sure, I'd prefer to have a, a cure for Parkinson's than something that's going to enhance someone's memory. But I have absolutely no idea how we bring about either. Nobody does. So we just have to let um, the scientists get on with pursuing the things that they're interested in. So I, I think we can calm down the rhetoric and the hype. Um, but uh, the reason why scientists engage in rhetoric and hype is because there is so much pressure to win grant money and to you know, make their uh, findings seem far, far more exciting <coughs> than they truly are. And I think a similar point to the... Yeah, yeah I mean, it's true. You know? I mean, I, I've, every grant I start starts with you know, disease, dollars and death. You know? it's, that's, that's what it's about. And I say this grant is going to address a clinical problem that affects 25 million people. You know, I mean, it, it's ridiculous the amount of pressure we put under and now with this impact statements on every grant application where you have to say in advance of doing the work what impact it's going to have on the world around you uh, if I had a crystal ball that was that good I wouldn't be doing what it is I'm doing um, anyway, rant over um, the, the question at the back about well shouldn't we do things um, better, I think yes yeah, similar kind of response to it, you've got a point uh, you know, maybe we should um, think about exactly how it is we examine people. Maybe we should think exactly how it is 
and we educate people. I think those, those are important things. That doesn't mean that we stop you know, investigating smart drugs and looking at other ways of doing things. I think the point that I disagreed with the most is the point that the lady make at, made at the front. Um, as it happens, I'm sick and tired of going to see my doctor and have him or her explain to me um, how I can make their job easier for them. <laughs> I want them to give me the treatments that I need to live the life that I've chosen to live. Um, that's what medicine should do for me, not give me a moral lecture about how I should be living my life. My work in, is obviously geared towards finding cognitive enhancing drugs for neuropsychiatric disorders for people who really need them because most of these disorders, like ADHD, like Alzheimer's disease and like schizophrenia, all have cognitive problems associated with them and that's what the goal is and that's what I've done with the cholinesterase inhibitors to help bring them to market. But in the process of that, you do do studies in healthy humans and you do detect these things, and that's where that comes out. But also, I, I believe the gentleman called Rob at the back was saying that basically understanding the brain, as in a psychopharmacology laboratory as my own, we use drugs as tools to understand how the brain works. And so we try to understand what dopamine does in the brain, what noradrenaline does in the brain to change or modulate, as we call it, cognition. And those studies can be done in, in normal, healthy people. With reference to the smart drugs we've been talking about, it seems like, they, what, like you're saying that they decrease impulsiveness, but like what you call impulsiveness, that like I might call creativity. And it's like, so I think like, it's, it's, I know it's a really specific point, but like, it sort of arises on the, on the non-extreme end of the scale of kids with ADHD. Like, what used to be like a quirk of personality, I, I like just find, like wanting to jump from one thing to the next. It's now like disease. It just seems a little excessive. I am a tired junior doctor. <laughs> it's a suggestion. I was interested in what you were saying about modafinil. Uh, there's stuff that's normally used in sleep apnea, and where coerciveness, cohesiveness comes in with that. Because are you going to be viewed as a bad doctor? Are you going to be viewed as an inconsistent doctor if you if you don't take them the drug? And that's not really my choice. That's you know that's going to be an overriding choice, and it's a difficult one to make. I think. I just wanted to know where your stance was on things like illegal drugs, um, so like MDMA or amphetamines, and just like what your stance is on like perhaps enhancement, but in terms of like pleasure, um, is it only okay if it's enhancement in terms of things which we view to be like um, educational? Well, first to that final question, no, <laughs> absolutely not. If, if if the enhancements are only to improve something in terms of utility or value to society, what a miserable place that would be. I think certainly enhancements are for leisure and pleasure as, as much as they are for utility. There might not be a big difference between the two in many cases. But it seems to me at, at the heart of this is a question about risk. We've not talked about it very much. Now, of course, if you, if you listen to the doctors, which many of us should, um, at least some of the time, <laughs> you, um, <laughs> you might be led to believe that all these things are too much of a risk for you to take. And so it would be unwise of you to uh, take smart drugs at all. Now, of course, that's all well and good if you can understand, first of all, what they're saying. But second of all, if you make sense of how this fits with your own particular lifestyle. We all lead lives where risk is apparent and, and we make a decision about what level of risk we're happy with. My concern about the smart drugs is that um, maybe it has to do with what Barbara said about drugs over the internet. Um, if we had our own personal kits to detect the biochemical properties of each drug that we bought over the internet that could then reveal to us the, the kinds of medium and, and long-term, if they were known, side effects associated with them, maybe we'd be in a much stronger position to, um, I guess, do so in a way that is autonomous and is going to promote our own agency. Um, a lot of what I've heard suggests that we are not able to do that at this point, that we have such a lack of knowledge that it's very difficult to make any kind of informed decision about the value of these modifications. So there's a big challenge, but, but the bigger picture, I think, is, is a question about what kinds of risks we're happy for people to take in their lives. It might not be that the kinds of drugs we're talking about today are the most effective ways of, of trying to promote safe enhancements, but the continued development of those drugs may lead to a situation like that. Um, so yes, in that respect, it's still spe speculative and it's still perhaps exaggeration, but that, that possibility, that prospect of finding technologies that can allow us to enhance ourselves in a way that is sufficiently safe, I think uh, will be the crucial test. So I guess I just have two points. One is that we have to keep finding more effective and better uh, cognitive enhancing drugs for people who really need them, who have uh, problems 
uh, such as ADHD and uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease and, um, and some of the other disorders such as schizophrenia. Now we heard about um, ADHD, but it, it, if you have severe ADHD, NICE of course recommends these drugs for t your treatment if, if cognitive behavioral approaches have been tried and failed. And if you don't take them, you end up with a very poor uh, outcome. So you might uh, you know, have school dropout or other um, problems associated with crime and so forth. So they, are, they do have a place and they're very important. Um, for healthy people, I think we've discussed a, a lot of the important ethical issues associated with healthy people taking these drugs. So I think it is important that we think about how, how society might be changed and what are the issues to consider. Because actually, um, you know, these are on the increase. So there is an increasing lifestyle use of these drugs, and now is the time to consider what we want to do about them. I think uh, what Barbara said is absolutely right. We're, we're not debating about the ethics of research into neuropsychiatric disorders or the use of existing agents or developing better agents, in other words, Barbara's research, because there isn't a debate to be had. We're, what we're talking about is it in essentially healthy people, where the risk-benefit equation is very, very different, and people need to remember that. It's a different setup. And, I mean, I, I'll, I'll just finish by saying what, what the position of, of the army is on this, who, by the way, fund much of this research, because potentially it could be of interest to them. But at the moment, you know, if you get to go into war and peace... The view that we have is, is the best way to enhance performance at the moment, and probably for the foreseeable future, is through the things that the military do very well. Training, exercises, morale, cohesion, leadership, etc. They probably do that better than most other organisations that we have, and other organisations could well learn a huge amount from what they do. Because the military have all, you know, of any organisation, they have a lot to gain from this kind of technology at the moment. They don't think that they do. I'm not sure it's the job of uh, medicine or science to decide what um, risks people should and shouldn't take and what benefits people should and shouldn't accept. I do think that's a broader public discussion. It's up to you um, in the context of your life to decide <coughs> what risks and benefits you want to pursue. And it's up to all of us to have a conversation um, about that. It is perhaps the job of science and medicine to point out accurately um, what those risks and benefits are. And maybe if we're failing at the moment, it's, it's failing in that. Um, that there's a real sense of, of hype um, around um, what's happening at the moment that doesn't accurately reflect what's really happening. So you could say the fact that 16% of um, students and, and academics are taking these drugs reflects um, their sense of hype about it or their uh, unwarranted sense of expectation about what these drugs are going to um, bring them. And then you could equally argue that the fact that 84% of people don't bother um, reflects the fact that they're not very good. So I can have that stat both ways to point both my points. Um, I think you know, we're being overly dark and overly um, optimistic about what the future brings. We need to relax a bit, let scientists do their explorations, let them do their investigations, and let's just see what the future does bring. Thank you very much indeed.